Pixie Day. Um, would you like to tell me the story that you told uh, while last night about how you first met goats? Way back at the beginning? At the very beginning. Well, I was a child, a lonely child, in a very bad foster home. And uh, I never knew until years later why the other children could not play with me. And my foster mother had spread some untrue stories about me. But there came a big jolly Irish woman who gave for the child a gift of love. And the gift was in the form of a little brown goat with a black stripe down her back, little black hoofs and horns. <coughs> and um, the child and the goat bonded immediately. And they, together they roamed the fields of summer and the woods. And when the child came home from school, she would call to the goat. And there was an answering bleat and a clatter of hoofs on the sidewalk beside the house. And Posy Jane would come to meet the child, and together they would play and run. And when the, ch uh, the goat was tired, she would come and put her head in the child's lap and take a nap. And there came a day when the child heard that from the top of the quarry cliff, which was across the river and beyond the meadow, uh, the whole world could be seen. So she decided that this was a day when miracles occurred, and she began to climb the quarry wall while Posy Jane bow, uh, browsed contentedly on things below. Part way up the cliff, the child made the mistake of looking down, and she froze. Her legs shook and her knees trembled, and she called desperately for the little goat below. And there was an answering bleat, and Posy Jane threaded her way up the cliff touched the child's knees with her muzzle, and together they threaded their way down the cliff and across the meadows of summer, the world unseen but all of life ahead. And there came another day, the worst day, the day of heartbreak. The child came home from school, called a posy Jane, and there was no answering bleat. There was no clatter of hoofs on the sidewalk. Posy Jane had been sold to a butcher for money. And, of course, I was that child. I never really got over it. And when my children <coughs> were 14 and 12, almost 12, after a traumatic divorce, we moved to Maine in search of a better life. And shortly thereafter, they expressed a desire to have a goat, and I thought they should have a goat, and they should never come home and find it gone. After a short search, we found the little white twins at the Reverend Jordan's in Warren, Maine. And it was love at first sight. I bought both twins and home they came with us. And wherever we went on foot, they followed at our heels. And often after school, my son would go through the woods beyond the rented farm, climb the heaps of gravel beyond the woods, and the goats at his heels would take off into the air like rockets. It was a good time. And uh, then the Reverend Jordan introduced us to goat shows. I had never known there was such a thing. At the first show, Heidi was selected junior champion, and Christy was reserved, and I was hooked. <laughs> and there came a time when I began working nights at Sylvania, 11 to 7. And when I came home, I would load the kids and my sleeping bag into the back of the Volkswagen truck, and we would drive to a huge hay field which sloped down to the sea. And the goats would browse on seaweed and evergreens and lush grass while I slept in the sleeping bag. And often they would come and nestle beside me, and they would just stay there until it was time to go home. Uh, after a while, I, began, I was elected director in the American Dairy Goat Association. And one day in the Sana newsletter, it was a letter from a gentleman in Russia named Alex Bodrov. He had been a professor. His wife was an assistant professor. But because of the shortage of food, they decided to buy an old farm and raise their own food. They got some chickens, some sheep, three pigs, uh, a horse, two heifers, and, of course, goats. Uh, the goats came from a few from Czechoslovakia, two from a zoo. And I knew immediately what I had to do. You get this nudge that says, this is what you have to do. How did he contact you? Uh, through the letter in the Sana newsletter. 
and he wanted information about the breed, Sonnen. So I thought lots of people would answer his letter. So I wrote and uh, offered him a doe kid, a good doe kid. Nobody else answers his letter. And I told him that I would take care of the shipping. Well, he was overwhelmed by my letter, but he said, but we have no ocean by my farm. He thought shipping meant to come on a freighter. So I explained that it would come by air. He must pick it up in Moscow. And uh, he had explained that he lives five hours from Moscow by his car, two hour, two days by his truck. And so uh, I was a little bit concerned about how to go about it. Nobody had ever done it. We started at a local level. We went to a state level, to a national level, to the embassy in Washington, D.C. Nobody had any answers. It was finally decided that the doe must be kept in quarantine at least 50 feet from all other goats, uh, and she must have every shot available for cows and for sheep. Poor Freya. Uh, one of the vials when I took her to the vet was labeled, can cause death. I shuddered. Freya didn't know it. Uh, her name was Playbell Farm Freedom's Gift, but we called her Freya for short. So I built a pen in my woodshed attached to the house, it was the only place available, installed a wood, uh, uh, a hay feeder, a grain feeder, a water bucket, lots of shavings, and Freya. Freya was not happy. She did not like being separated. So every day I took her uh, by a car to a friend's woodlot and we played hide and seek for at least an hour. She soon learned that when I picked her up to put her back in the car, it was back in jail. She was not happy. I played a radio. I visited her frequently, and uh, she had had all of her shots. She didn't die. And eventually, it was time for her to go. I decided on Swiss Air, thinking that was the uh, land of Heidi. This was the best place to send her. So we drove to Boston, and we located Swiss Air cargo. And there was a big, long, U-shaped driveway. I was here, cargo was over here, but in between were police cars, uh, motorcycle cops, uh, fire trucks, and ambulances. So I drove up boldly and I said, I must go over there. No, lady, you cannot go over there. I said, I must go over there. And finally, in the exasperation, he said, why must you go over there? And in the meantime, he had told me that President Clinton was down at the end of the driveway in Air Force One. I could not possibly go over there. And finally, when I, uh, he said, why must you go over there? I said, this goat must go to Russia. Go, lady, go, go. We went. I had her on a leash. We took her into the office. She immediately pulled all the papers off the desk, and they said, yeah, that's a goat. <laughs> so... She started on her way to Russia. Uh, she stayed overnight in Zurich at a veterinary facility. We was taking very good care of her, and I have a letter from them thanking me for sending her. That's what Swiss Air. Um, she arrived in Moscow, and Alex picked her up, and I was concerned that she would have trouble acclimating to strange goats, strange country, strange people. And Alex wrote and he said, she refuses to be offended. She goes merrily out to pasture with my goat. She is now a Russian goat. And he ended it with, our dream is to see you on our farm. And I thought, yeah, that chance, let me go to Russia. <laughs> then he told me about Winrock International, which is a philanthropic church-based organization. They pay all of your expenses except for farm care at your home. And so I wrote him a letter. And I ended it with, uh, they asked what my level of education was, and I said, graduate of the School of Hard Knocks. And I thought, they'll throw that in the wastebasket. That's the end of that. Two days later, I got a call. How soon can you go? How long can you stay? And by the way, are you afraid to go alone? The companion who was to go with you got bitten by a brown recluse spider and is in the hospital in Texas. I said, afraid? Why should I be afraid? Here I go. So I got my passport, and I studied 
for two weeks, uh, tape, language tapes from the State Library in Russia, and I thought I had a pretty good grasp of the basic phrases, you know, uh, Dobryudra, so forth, uh, good morning, this is a beautiful child, onward, so. Anyway, the way I went, I got the customs, and my mind went blank. All I could remember was, Yapatiela, be a sumka, get a toilet. I lost my handbag, where's the toilet? They were not favorably impressed. And there was a group of people waiting to meet the incoming passengers. I had no idea of what Alex looked like. I pictured a big, burly farmer with a beard and boots. My heart knew him immediately. He was clean-shaven, not a very big guy, neatly dressed, with a smile as big as all outdoors and his arm full of roses. He saw that I was in trouble. He came over and said, Ah, my grandmother, come. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> so he took me to my first uh, assignment, which was Tamara Brusova, wonderful woman. She, her husband had worked for the embassy in Washington, and there she had learned English, and she sewed for the ladies. And uh, she greeted me warmly and took me to her home, and she said, you must treat this like your house. I said, no, Tamara, you don't want me to do that. We went in, and she proudly showed me her new bathroom. Uh, it had a wide doorway, and it had a sink and a toilet. Then she explained to me that a previous volunteer, uh, it, she was a very wide woman, and it had taken two workers to be able to push her through the doorway into her, her outhouse. So she wanted to make sure that I was comfortable. She had this wide doorway to the bathroom. I had no trouble getting in. <laughs> and uh, one of the first things I saw when I entered her house was this huge cow's head boiling in a pot on the stove. I thought, oh dear, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so she had a nice dog, excuse me, named Lassie. He stayed under the table, and I would say, oh, Tamara, what is that over there? And LASIK would get treats under the table, and I was able to manage most of the things that she would tell me were very special pixies. So anyway, uh, we bonded immediately, and she had a, a very fierce dog outside, Chain. Uh, it was a Chetian mountain dog, and uh, he looked like something like a German shepherd, and she said, don't go, pixie, do not go near, very fierce. So I went over to the dog, I held out my hand, and he sniffed it. And I talked to him, and then he rolled over on his back and waved his feet in the air. And her worker said, how can this be? That dog does not understand English. And I said, you tell her the dog understands love. <laughs> and we were friends. And um, we spent a wonderful five days. She became the sister I had never had. And I have a, had a picture of her that her son took. Um, we were coming up from the barn with our arms around each other. And I said, is that yours or mine? Not mine. Excuse me. Okay. So, we have just had this vicious dog who... Oh, yeah. And then I, uh, her son took pictures of us coming up from the, the uh, barn. And I sent her the picture and wrote sisters over it. Uh, her son came twice daily from Moscow. Or not twice daily, twice weekly and brought things that she needed, and then he would take back her products and sell them in a little shop in Moscow. And one day he went to the shop, and there were three men there from Chechnya, and they said, this is now our shop. He didn't say much. He reached in, and he took out a gun. He stood there, and he said, this is my mother's shop. And the men went away, and they did not come back. And um, so he remained uh, what, twice a week coming to his mother's, and when they had first moved there, uh, they moved from Moscow, and she wanted to raise her own food. So they bought the land, and they had to build a house and a barn, and she didn't know what to buy to construct these uh, structures. So uh, they built a little shelter like an A-frame out of saplings, and there they slept at night while the animals huddled around them because they could hear the wolves in the distance in the forest. And, but the pig refused to stay outside. He insisted on coming in and sleeping with him. And as I say, she didn't know what to buy, so she knelt in the shelter that night and she prayed to her Heavenly Father to let her know what she should buy. And that night she had a dream. And in the dream she saw very clearly the materials that she would need. 
So when she awakened, she rushed to write it down before she should forget. And that's exactly what she ordered. And when they were through, she had left over a few splintered boards, some bricks, and some nails. And if that isn't faith, I don't know what is. So after a while, her husband said, I cannot live like this. I shall go back to Moscow. She said, I cannot go back to Moscow. I shall stay here. And that's what they did. And after uh, I was ready to leave tomorrow, by then we had become really bonded. And uh, a representative from Winrock came to take me to Alex's farm, and I had my arm out the window. Tamara came over with tears running down her face. She took my hand, wiped the tears from her face, and placed it over her heart. And it was difficult. And uh, we got to Alex's. I was warmly greeted. They held a reception for me in the big uh, wooden building they called it the club. They really lighted, and it had a stage. And these beautiful Russian children did the wonderful folk songs and dances in Russian costumes. And I was seated in the front row as a guest of honor with Alex at my side. And suddenly I realized it was a child sitting next to me and looking up at me with dark, short dark hair and a very worn out red bunny suit. And the child kept looking up at me and didn't say anything. And one of the women had, women had said to Alex, is that woman really from America? And he said, yes, yes. And she said, but she is just like us. And I think that was the best compliment I had ever received. So when we went upstairs for refreshments, and there should be a picture of that, but I guess there isn't. Uh, see, they've been taken sort of out of order. Uh, we went upstairs for refreshments, but the child did not come. But we passed the same child on the way back to Alex's farm, and I waved and shot them right up in the air and waved back. And so I wrote to Alex after I got home, and I said, could you send me the name of the little boy who sat next to me in the club? He said, no, Ma, not boy, girl. I said, no, no, and I described her. He said, Ma, I have a picture. Her name is Natasha. She was adopted. Now they are sending her back to the orphanage. And later, uh, the woman who teaches the children the Russian folk song and dances had us to tea to her little Isba, her home, very nice inside, tapestries on the wall. And she told me Natasha's story. And the child had watched her 15-year-old brother murder her father with a knife. And the mother couldn't handle it. And Natasha was only five years old. She gave her to an older sister. The older sister couldn't keep her. She took her to a village store and left her there with no identification. And that's how she ended up in the orphanage the first time. Then she was adopted by a family in the village that could have no children. Strangely enough, then the mother got pregnant by a neighbor. But that was their child. Then uh, she got pregnant again by the neighbor. This time, they had a little boy, their child. Natasha's abuse began then. Uh, she was made to take care of the, the baby. She was abused physically and emotionally. And finally, um, the older girls in the school it went from kindergarten to high school. They could see way across the fields in the snow, Natasha running from the house with her father chasing her. He tore her clothes off and began beating her with a belt. And the, the girls ran and got her away from the father and probably saved her life. Then I guess the father and the mother got worried, and so they kept Natasha home from school. And the people in the village came, and they took her clothes away from her, made her stay in bed. The people in the village came, and they said, you cannot treat this child like this. And he said, she is ours, I will do as I wish. Then the teachers came and they said, Natasha must come to school. She must learn. He said, a belt is the best teacher. I will teach this child. Then I guess they got a little bit alarmed. So the mother took her, got her clothes on her, and took her on a little bus that winds through all these little villages to Torzhok, where the inspector of children is. She took her to the doorway, pushed her through, and said, we don't need this girl. Take her. Again, she's rejected. So, on the next trip, yeah.
there we are. Uh, I visited the school, and Natasha was no longer this vivacious child. She was very timid. Here are the children in the orphanage, and I had brought presents for, for my, sis, uh, my daughter and myself for Natasha. She has them in the bag. And I learned later she was able to keep them less than 24 hours. The other children took them away from her. And she, she lost all hope. Uh, there, the uh, administrator of the orphanage is, and that's Alex with her. And I knew, again, what I had to do. I had to find a home for Natasha. Well, I went through four families and two years. And for one reason or another, this family couldn't take her, but they knew of somebody who could. And finally, right in the next town, and I was working with MAPS, which is an uh, international uh, adoption agency. I found this family right in the next town, and he interviewed him, and he said, Pixie, that family is perfect. They can afford it, they have no children, and she's not afraid to go to Russia. So she went to Russia. Alex had her and uh, Natasha and a friend of Natasha's at the orphanage at his farm, hoping that they would become friends. The woman ignored her. She saw another child. And she came home, and I was waiting for the phone call. And the phone call came, and she said, we're not adopting Natasha. She has problems. We found another girl. And I got mad at God, and I yelled at him. And I said, I'm not praying anymore, and you know why. And then I went back the next day and I said, I'm sorry. And all the time there was this wonderful family in Utah that wanted her. But they keep hearing from their mother that I had another family for her. Well, it was like it was meant to be. Uh, they passed their FBI uh, test and they had had foster children. And it took them eight days in Russia. Usually it takes a month. They took Natasha out for walks. They played with her. Uh, and then, strangely enough, they don't usually do this. Natasha had to go to court with them, and she was very timid. And it was a female judge. And the judge asked uh, Natasha, she said, do you want these people to adopt you? Da, which is yes. Do you realize you will have to learn English? Da. Do you realize you will have to go to America? Da. And then she got to Terry, and she, the father, and she said, how do you plan to support this child? And he had a good job in computers. I'm not sure just what it was. And they usually asked 10 questions. She asked that, and then she said, how will you treat any medical problems she has? I have two pediatricians waiting to, to see her. And she asked a third question. Then she went into chambers. She came out and she said, take your daughter home. And I just fell apart when I saw that tape. I just, I, I couldn't handle it. And yet, I, I wasn't sure. I was afraid something would go wrong. So the minute they got home, there were 40 people from that family to meet them at the airport. And I said, was Natasha with them? She said, oh, yes. And so she now is in her early 20s. She has a wonderful family. There's, um, there's a picture of her. Yeah, but that's later. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead with that. But... Okay. Um, when I was at Alex's, he had come here, sponsored by Lindbach, made a trip to America. And some of you probably know Margie Luby, and she has lovely Nubians. We visited her farm, and Alex said, Oh, look at those goats. So, anyway, there were no Nubians in Russia. He said, someday I will save my money and I will bring a Nubian to Russia. Again, I knew what I had to do. <laughs> it's never easy. So anyway, uh, I talked to Margie. She was very receptive. She built quarantine facilities. By then we knew the rules. And put the goats in it, a buck and a dough. I bought them for from her. And we went through all the, they no longer had to have all the cow and sheep tests that was there about. 
we decided to ship them from Boston by uh, British Airways because it would be a more direct route. We got to, uh, after all the tests, we got to Boston, me driving, Margie reading the, the uh, signs, got into the cargo place, and uh, the man said, oh no, no, you cannot use those crates, you must have wooden crates. And I looked at Marge and she looked at me, we had no wooden crates. He said, but I will give you wooden crates. Then he looked at the papers and he said, do you realize that when these goats land in England, they will be euthanized? Because we don't allow livestock from England because of the threat of hoof and mouth disease. So in retaliation, they will not accept goats to land in England. So I looked at Marge, she looked at me, and out we went. I drove, she read the road signs. We got home and we started all over again. And this time, we sent them from right here in Portland. It was so much simpler. The only trouble we ran into was in the lobby, and little boy could say, Mama, look at these funny dogs, they're making funny noises. And that was the goat. So the goats went, and um, they arrived in, uh, in Russia with no problem. However, by then, uh, the dough was coming in heat, and I got hold of Alex, and I said, she's too young to be bred. You'll have to keep him in separate crates. Well, he couldn't fit two crates in the back of his vehicle. So Alex doesn't give up. He got behind his car, took his pants off, took his long underwear off, put his pants back on, and put the long underwear on the bus coat. <laughs> <laughs> Ma, almost many accidents. People look and say, oh, don't wear his clothes. Why? And he had built a nice place for spot. And the dough, the dough, the And so Alex now had newbies. Yeah. I made another trip to Russia. This time, and I don't know if any of you know Johnny Ray Malden. He lived in Texas at the time, and then moved to Arizona. And um, he was my fellow volunteer, a great guy. We teamed up in Zurich, we met each other in Zurich, and went on to St. Petersburg, where we put on the first goat show that had ever been done in Russia. The people do for nothing. And, uh, there are pictures of them. Uh, let's see, where are they going to the goat show? Oh, okay. So they, we got them to the ring, and it rained on top of everything else. And they had blankets over the goats, they had coats over the goats, but the rain let up just in time for the show. And to get them just to travel in a circle was very difficult. They didn't understand. And two of the goats refused to be separated, so they went around the ring together, side by side. <laughs> yeah, you can see the two of them. <coughs> then one of the kids decided it was lunchtime, and went to the ring and built, drank, drank uh, all the milk out of his mother. And uh, we called him the buffoon, but not to his face. He was a nice enough guy, but he was, had some problems. And he got junior champion with his goat. So he left the ring, he called up the radio station, told him he had the best goat in all of Russia, and they should put it on the news. Then he came back with his special vest on and paraded around the ring with his goat. And then, uh, he's there hugging, yeah, over on the lower right-hand corner, is Roman hugging his goat. He loved his goats, he really did. And. At the close of the show, the barrage balloon came down in the middle of the goat show. Is there a picture of that? Yeah, okay, yeah, you can see the end of it there. It looks like a beach whale. And there is a picture there of, of the goat on the milk stand. That's one of Alex's goats. And the people gathered around that, they were more interested in goat being milk than they were in the goat show. So they all wanted to try the milk. 
And there was a picture of, uh, where are the gentlemen? Oh yeah, over in the middle on the left hand side, uh, the gentleman on the right is the administrator of agriculture in Russia. And the one on the left is his assistant. And they were trying to go build and they were very polite. They said they liked it. So anyway, uh, that was the first goat show Russia had ever had. Uh, in the middle? No, the blue sweater is me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's me. Uh, I acted as consultant because in Russia the men are sort of in charge. So Johnny Gray <laughs> announced the winners, and I just went over it with him. <laughs> Uh, the children on the lower right, that's when they put on the, the Russian folk songs and dances. And um, let's see, uh, in the middle of the bottom is an old church in Alex's village. And there were a bunch of uh, logs piled up beside it. And on the first visit there, I said to Alex, why are those there? He said, when I am a rich man, I will rebuild this church for my people. But he never will be because he gives everything away. He buys a bicycle for a child, a house for, of course the houses aren't that great, but he'll buy a house for somebody whose house is burned. He buys toys for the children, and he gives away everything that he has. Um, let's see. Oh, in the, in the middle on the left, that's a doctor in the village with the and he's not dressed in his, his uh, medical garb there, but he's a great guy. But on the last trip that I was there, uh, I went back with Natasha. She wanted to find her, uh, her biological family, and we did, but well, we found out what happened to them. The house burned and they were in it. And at least that's what we were told. Uh, I asked if she could get uh, see where their graves were so we could take pictures. Nobody knows. Uh, I asked if she could get her birth certificate. Everything burned. I think they're still alive. The mother was an alcoholic. The brother had killed her father. And they saw pictures of Natasha's family here in America. And I don't think they wanted to promote any relationship between them. They saw that she had a good home. They said, go home and be happy. And that's a doctor. And there was a spring there that had uh, powers, of, uh, powers of religion that cured anything. He had a problem with alcohol. And so he goes one way every day to bring a spring, and then he brings home great big jugs of this water. And he has to have a drink since. So whether it's his faith in the water, or whether it really works, I don't know. I didn't get in it. I drank some, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, that woman down at the bottom, um, she's referred to as the crazy lady. She's a wonderful person. She worked on munitions during the war, and it was against her principles to have anybody killed. And she just, she couldn't handle it mentally. And she lived alone in a little building. Uh, she had some goats, and each day she would walk into the forest two miles with the goats and let them browse. Then she would come home, and she would milk the goats and share the milk with the village. And she's a wonderful woman. And I gave her a great big hug, and she hugged me, and we were glad to know each other. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, over here on the right, on the bottom. And on the top, that's when we had the refreshments. And in the middle on the top, that's when we went upstairs for refreshments after the children were born. Okay. And so now I gotta get back to Alex. While I was there, we went on the great mushroom hunt into the forest. 
and it had been raining and raining and raining. His fields of oats were flooded, and we slogged down the road into the forest, and then he showed me all these indentations in rows through the woods where the trenches had been, where their young man lived and died. And he said, all our fine young men now sleep forever. And he said, only mushrooms live here now. And so every mushroom I found, oh, no, no, Pixie, very bad, very bad mushroom. Finally, I found this big one, and I called Alex and said, oh, king mushroom, very rare. So it rode proudly on the top of the other mushrooms home to his house, where the women prepared a wonderful soup that night. And all I could think of were these mushrooms were nourished on the bones of their young men. But maybe that's a good thing to happen. Something lived. And so um, I spent, I think, about ten days at Alex's farm. And one night at the table, it was sort of like a booth like this. And he sat away uh, across from me, and the others sat over here. And we talked and we talked. He speaks English fairly well. He had to tra translate uh, in the university uh, treatises from America into Russian. And we talked and talked and talked, and finally he reached across the table, he took my hand, and he looked into my heart, and he said, you are my mother. His mother had died in the war, his father had lost an arm, and later died. And now I am his mother, he called me Ma. And um, he signs our letters, uh, your kids, Alex and Nadia. Her name is Nadezda, but they call her Nadia for short. She speaks no English whatsoever. We managed to make ourselves understood. And before I left, I went out and I took from his deals a rock about this big around, that, that thick and reddish color. And I was washing it in this little sink. It has a pail overhead with holes and the water comes through. And, that, and uh, Nadia came over and she's looking at me and I explained to her, your deals, your rock, to my home. And she understood and she took the rock and she was washing it and Alex came in and he said, why? Why? And she told him, and he had tears in his eyes. He knew that his rock would go on my wall of memories at home. And I have rocks from all over. Um, so when we left, uh, it was difficult. Nadia came out and she was hanging on to me and tears running down her face and she waved at their fields that I must remember. And um, I came home and part of my heart was left there. And since then, we kept in touch. He calls me, Ma, Ma, it's me, Alex. And um, he always called me my birthday and Christmas and in between Mother's Day. He keeps track of things. Mm -hmm. And it's just been a heartfelt experience. I love these people like they're my own. And I left part of my heart there. And uh, I'm, I'm getting hoarse, so I'm going to have to leave the rest for another time. That is wonderful. So, these people are my family. They're my Russian families, and I pray for them every night and in between. <laughs>